So when we're looking at limits, we're interested in knowing what is a function getting close to as we approach a specific x value? The function doesn't have to have an, an actual value at that x value, but it has to get close to a value at that x value. Sometimes it has a value, like when I would touch the wall. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you just get really, really close to the wall. The limit's still the wall, either way because I'm still approaching the wall, okay? All right, so notation around this. The notation that we use is the limit as x approaches a value a, and I know this is kind of hard to see, so maybe I'll just write this out again. The limit as x approaches a, and a is a number, of a specific function, f of x is equal to a value, and that's called the limit, okay? So we're going to do an example. We're going to start out with an easy example. Let's say f of x equals x squared, okay? And let's say we just do a simple graph, so uh, 1, 1, two, four, and then the next one would be three, nine, so it would be like off the page up there. Okay. I could say, let's say I'm looking at this point right here, that the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared is equal to 4. Okay? Because as x gets close to 2, the function gets close to 4. Okay, I could also say the limit as x approaches negative 1 of x squared. What would that be? 1. Yep, that's right here. Because when x gets close to negative 1, I'm getting close to negative 1 in this direction. I could also get close to negative 1 in this direction, right, as x is getting narrowing in on negative 1 in either direction. The function is getting close to, sorry, uh, the function, yes, is getting close to 1. The y value is getting close to 1. Okay. Now, how can we find these without graphing them? Well, we could use substitution. Right? So, for example, if I gave you another function, let's say I said f of x equals 2x plus 3. And I wanted to know what's the limit as x approaches 5 of f of x. So, in this case, by the way, in the first one, I actually plugged the function in directly into the limit. I wrote x squared. In this second one, I've defined a function f of x, and then within the limit, I should maybe do this so that we know, I've just written, instead of the 2x plus 3, I've written f of x. Okay, so you can do it both ways. And if you wanted to, you could replace on the next line f of x with 2x plus 3, with the expression 2x plus 3. So let's do that. The limit as x approaches 5 of 2x plus 3 is going to equal 2 times 5 plus 3, which is 13. This kind of makes sense because if you were plotting, if, you know, if you were, let's say you were making a table of values to graph that function, 
on a, on a coordinate plane. This is exactly what you do, right? You, you pick a bunch of x values, you plug those x values into the function, you get your y value. Okay. So sometimes, a lot of times, you don't have to graph them, you can just use substitution. That's only though if the function is continuous. So if the function is continuous, no problem, we can just use substitution. Okay, and in fact, if the function is continuous, the limit as x approaches a of f of x or p of x is p of a. You just plug the a value into the function, which is what we just did in this previous example, right? I looked at f of five, and that was my limit. As x approaches five, the limit is f of five. Okay, now for example, here, again, I, I apologize, my screen is not very good, but you have the notes in front of you. The limit as x approaches two of x cubed plus three x plus one over x squared minus six. Okay. By the way, is this continuous? Is this a continuous function? No, it's not. How come? How do you know? Yeah? Yes, there is a point of discontinuity. There's a couple, actually. Yeah, because of this denominator. This denominator can't actually be factored, right? But there are going to be some values. They're not rational, but there are some values of x that will make the denominator zero. Okay, so this one isn't continuous. However, if we're interested in the limit as x approaches two, if the x value that we're interested in is two, all we really care about is, is it continuous when x equals two? When x equals two, is the function continuous? Yeah, yeah because if you plug a two into the denominator, you're not gonna get zero. Okay, so if it's continuous, as x approaches two, we can just use substitution, okay? So in this case, this is just gonna equal two cubed plus three times two plus one over two squared minus six. That's it. So that is, uh, I don't know, eight plus six plus one 8 plus 6 is 14 plus 1, 15, over 4 minus 2 is negative 2. Okay, so the limit as x approaches 2 of x cubed plus 3x plus 1 over x squared minus 6 is equal to 15 over negative 2, or negative 7.5. And if we actually graphed this function, and we looked at the function, there would be a point at 2, negative 7.5 on the graph. Okay? So, this is all pretty straightforward, hopefully, but there are problems that arise when the function is not continuous at the place where we want to see if there's a limit. And just because it's not continuous, doesn't necessarily mean that there's no limit. And so that's what we're going to spend some time looking at. Okay, so for example, there's going to be discontinuity. We already kind of looked at that here. If the denominator of the function is zero, right? So if I have something like one over x plus two, there's going to be a, a discontinuity where x is equal to negative two. Okay, so there, there's going to be some complications there. And what we're going to do is we're going to use some algebraic tricks to try and see if, in fact, there is a limit where there is discontinuity in the function.
okay? Because the point on the function doesn't have to exist for the limit to exist. Because we don't want to know what the point on the function is. We just want to know if there's a specific value on the function that exists where when we approach a specific x value. Okay? So I'll give you actually an example. Let's say I was looking at um, something like this, uh, just to kind of make that clear. This is a completely different example. If I looked at y equals um, x plus 3 times x plus 1 over x plus 3. Okay, let's say I looked at that as my function. Okay, I can simplify here, right? I can cancel the x plus 3s. However, for this function, x cannot equal negative 3. There is still discontinuity at that, at that point because in the original function, if I put in a negative 3 value for x, I get a 0 in the denominator. So what this would look like on a graph is this. It's going to look like y equals x plus 1. But when x equals negative 3, whoops, there's a hole. And this y value is negative 2. There's a hole in the graph. So it looks like a linear, it looks like the linear function y equals x plus 1, with the exception of it having a hole at this point. This is the point negative 3, negative 2. Okay? So just because it's discontinuous at a specific point doesn't mean that there's no limit there. If I look at the limit when x approaches negative 3, it's still negative 2. Because when you approach negative 3, the function approaches negative 2. Okay? So this is the kind of thing that we're going to be looking at. We're going to see if we can do something like this, where we maybe we can cancel something using some algebra skills so that we can, in fact, see if there's a limit at a particular x value. Okay? All right, so here's our first one. Limit as m approaches 0 of m minus 1 squared minus 1. Okay, so just glancing at this, we can see that there's a problem because m is approaching 0 and there's an m in the denominator. So we can't use substitution here because if we use substitution, we would have an undefined value. Okay? So we have to kind of play with this a little bit algebraically. Okay? Now, what I see here is I see something squared minus 1. You have something squared minus 1. When you think about factoring, you have something squared minus 1. How could you factor that? Difference of squares, exactly. So let's try and factor this and see what happens. So this is going to equal the limit as m approaches 0 of m minus 1 plus 1 times m minus 1 minus 1, right? Because the first term in each of these brackets has to be the square root of m minus 1 squared, which is m minus 1. And the second term in each bracket has to be the square root of 1, which is 1. Okay? Over m. Yep? Well, let's, let's simplify. See how it changes things. Okay? equals the limit as m approaches 0. Okay, in this bracket I've got m minus 1 plus 1. What does that become? m times m minus 1 minus 1. 
m minus 2 over m. OK. What can I do now? I can cancel the m's. And now, if I plug in a 0, I will not have an undefined value anymore. And at this point, you can do a substitution. So now I can sub in a 0 and say this is going to equal 0 minus 2, because that's all that's left, which is negative 2. So this, uh, this limit does, in fact, exist, and it's equal to negative 2. Yes, so you could also, this is not the only way that you can do this. You could also expand this if you wanted to, and then factor. Yep. And there are often lots of different ways. What you're going to see is when you're working with limits, you're kind of like massaging the expression a bit to get something that you want, which is why I, I really enjoy doing this kind of math. Because sometimes you start out and you're like, I'm not really sure where I'm going here. And you have to try something and see if it works. And then it doesn't work. And then maybe you have to go back to the drawing board and try something else. And if that doesn't work, you got to try something else. And eventually you may say, you know what? I don't think this one has a limit. And that sometimes happens too. Okay, But we're going to use a lot of different algebra skills when we're doing these. And once you do a lot of these, you're going to start to see, oh, you know what? When I see a question like this, I know that this would be a good step to take. Yeah? OK, so what I did with this guy was, let's say that m OK, let's say you do that. Then this expression becomes a squared minus 1. Okay, and that factors into a plus 1 times a minus 1. And then you sub the m minus 1 back in for a. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Here's another one. Okay, the limit as x approaches 4 of x minus 4 over the square root of x minus 2. Can we do a substitution right off the bat here? No, we can't because square root of 4 is 2. 2 minus 2 is 0. That's a problem. Okay. Now, when you see something like this, where you have the square root of something plus or minus something, anything with a radical in it, plus or minus something else, or sometimes it's a number plus or minus a radical. A really, really, really good thing to try, doesn't always work, but a really good thing to try is to multiply by the conjugate over the conjugate and see what happens. Okay? When I see something like this, this is always the first thing that I do. So that's what I'm going to do. The limit as x approaches 4 of x minus 4 over the square root of x minus 2, I'm going to put these in brackets, times, what is the conjugate of the square root of x minus 2? Yes. The square root of x, whoops, plus 2. And I have to do that in the numerator and the denominator so that really what I'm doing is just multiplying the expression by 1. OK, now let's see what happens. OK, so in the numerator, I'm just going to leave it as is, because I've actually kind of complicated things in the numerator a little bit. OK, so I've got x minus 4 times the square root of x plus 2. And in the denominator, square root of x times the square root of x is x, OK? 
Okay, now we know because we've multiplied by the conjugate, if we were to expand everything out, the middle two terms are going to equal zero. Okay, because conjugates are kind of like difference of squares, right? So I get like plus two square root of x minus two square root of x. So that's zero. And then negative two times two is four. Okay. All right, now what can I do? Cancel the x minus fours. That's pretty nice. Okay, now if I substitute in a four for x, I won't get an undefined value. Okay, so equals the square root of four plus two, which is two plus two, which is four. So as soon as you are able to use algebra to manipulate the expression into something where when you sub in the value that you want, you're not gonna get something undefined, you can sub in that value. Okay. Now this guy, I'm gonna rewrite this because it's really hard to see. We've got the limit as x approaches 1 half of 1 over x minus 2 over x minus 1 half. Okay, so we could see if we plug in a half there, half minus a half is 0. That's a problem. Okay, now when you see something like this, where you've got like addition and subtraction of fractions in either the numerator or the denominator or both. A really good thing to do here is to write either the numerator or denominator or both um, each expression using a common denominator. Okay, so here, this is one over x. This is like minus two over one. Right? This is x over 1 minus 1 over 2. So let's go ahead and do that and see what happens. Okay. Between x and 1, what's the least common denominator? x. Right? So over x, this is just still 1. This I have to multiply by 2, because it would be 2x over x is equal to 2. So minus 2x. Okay. For this guy, between 1 and 2, what's the least common denominator? 2. So I multiplied the denominator of 1 by 2. So this is going to be 2x over 2 is x. So this has to be a 2x. And then this guy is already over 2, so this is just minus 1. Does that make sense? Yeah? Going back to rational expressions a few years ago. Okay. Now what we're doing is we're taking one rational expression, dividing by another. So let's simplify that by taking the first one and multiplying by the reciprocal of the second and see what happens. Whoops, one half. Okay, so I'm going to take the first one. One minus two x over x times the reciprocal of this one, because I'm doing um, rational expression division here. 2 over 2x minus 1. Okay. Now, is there anything that I can simplify there? Well, 
What do you think? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so could I just cancel those out directly? No, I can't because they have the same terms with subtraction, but the order of the terms is reversed. So how would those simplify? Yeah. Yeah, you pull a negative out of one of them, right? So let's just, I'll move up here, equals the limit as x approaches a half. Maybe I'll pull a negative out of this guy of negative 1 times, well, now I'll just reverse it because I know that the signs are going to change. 2x minus 1 over x times 2 over uh, 2x minus 1. Okay, now I can cancel those two factors. And that is the limit as x approaches a half of negative 2 over x. Okay, now I'm good to do the substitution because I'm not going to get a zero in the denominator. So this is negative 2 divided by a half. Well, there's four halves in 2. So this is negative 4. Okay. Um, one thing about these two factors is... Um, if you know that you just have to factor out a negative sign, and you, because this, this kind of thing comes up a lot, you can cancel directly and just multiply by negative 1. Right? That's another option as well. And then you can kind of skip this line up here. Okay. Questions with that so far? No? Okay. Let's see what we have left. Oh yeah, limit as x approaches 0 of 1 over x. All right. Does anyone have any ideas here? Yep. Yeah? What's that? Unidentify. Is there anything we What do you think we could do here? Do you guys remember what this looks like graphically? This reciprocal function looks like, what's that? Yeah, it goes like this. So when we approach 0 from the left side, the function approaches negative infinity. And when we approach 0 from the right side, the function approaches positive infinity. Okay, there's divergence there. For a limit to exist, we need convergence as we approach a value from either side. So this limit does not exist. And when a limit does not exist, we write does not exist. Okay. Oh, I think I meant page 9. Did I, did I say page 9? I think I meant page, a different page. I meant a different page. I mean, I meant, oh, page 20, number 9. That's me reading things backwards again. I thought I said page 9, number 20. Yes, page 20, number 9. So I've written this down because I was like, I don't need you guys to all look it up. But page 20, number 9a is this. Of
Who said difference of cubes? Good job, yeah. Okay, so how did you think of that? How did you say, think of difference of cubes? Yeah, so when you look at something like this, right? The pre, you can't put an, an eight in here because cube root of eight is two. Two minus two is zero. So that's a problem, okay? When you're looking at something like this and you're like, what direction should I go in here? Ultimately, you want this to cancel, the cube root of x minus two to cancel with something in the numerator. And sometimes it's easier to turn this factor in the denominator into whatever factor you have in the numerator than vice versa, okay? So if we think of this factor in the numerator, right, this factors into a minus b times a squared plus ab plus b squared, Okay. Well, actually, the denominator is actually a factor of the numerator because if x is our a cubed, then the cube root of x is our a. Okay. And if 8 is our b cubed, the cube root of b is 2. Um, these exponents don't necessarily need to be three, okay? This exponent over here just needs to be three times this exponent. So cube root of x is x to the one-third. The exponent on x here is x to the one. One is three times one-third. Okay, so let's actually just think about this. If we wanted this to be x minus 8, well, this part, let's just write this out. a minus b times a squared minus ab plus b squared. Okay, this is our a minus b. Okay, so cube root of x is our a, 2 is our b. Oh, sorry, this should be a plus. I keep forgetting the sign switch, switches. Okay, so the other factor, and the reason we need the other factor is that if we multiply the, other, the denominator by the other factor, then the product will be x minus 8, and then the, fa the um, two factors will cancel. Okay, the other factor is going to be the cube root of x squared, because this first term has to be a squared, and our a is the cube root of x. So this is going to be the cube root of x squared. Okay, plus a b. So our a is the cube root of x, our b is 2. So plus 2 cube root of x plus b squared. b is 2, so b squared is 4. Yep. Okay, so the negative sign, yeah, exactly. So this is how um, something like a cubed minus b cubed factors. Yeah, we assume that a is positive and b is positive. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to multiply the numerator and denominator by this. Because if we multiply these two together, this should equal x minus 8. Okay, and if 
this equals, if the denominator equals x minus 8, I can cancel the denominator with this factor in the numerator. And then I get rid of my problem of having a 0 in the denominator. Okay, so let's try that. Plus 2 cube root of x plus 4 in the denominator. And then same thing in the numerator. Cube root of x squared plus 2 cube root of x plus 4. Whoops, I should have a bracket here. Okay, now what I'm going to get is same thing in the denominator, not the denominator, the numerator. Okay, so that's all the same. But when I multiply these two factors together, what should I get? X minus 8. Okay. Now I can cancel this. Now my denominator is just 1. Oh, <laughs> I did infinity instead of 8. x is not approaching infinity. x is approaching 8. That's better. OK. So now I can plug in an 8 for my x into this expression. OK, so I'm just going to write this out so it's a little bit cleaner x approaches 8 of the cube root of x squared plus 2 cube root of x plus 4. And I can now do a direct substitution. So this is going to be the cube root of 8 squared plus 2 times the cube root of 8 plus 4. And that is, cube root of 8 is 2, so 2 squared plus 2 times cube root of 8 is 2 plus 4. And that is 4 plus 4 plus 4, which is 12. So that's some pretty, like, fancy manipulation there. They're not all that complicated, okay? That's a pretty high-level limit, okay? But a lot of them are like the previous ones that we just did. Um, so some things to keep in mind is on the first page, um, with things like rational expressions, Try and see if you can factor everything and see if there's common factors. Because often there are, and the common factors will factor out. Okay, if you see something with a radical in it, conjugates, think about conjugates. If you see something where you have uh, fractional addition, subtraction, or rational addition, subtraction, common denominators. Okay, and then sometimes also the limit doesn't exist. Right? And often that trips people up because when we ask a question, people are like, well, there has to be a limit because the question was find the limit. Okay? The limits aren't always, they don't always exist. Okay? All right, so questions. Okay, I am going to stop there. <laughs>